So let's move on to talk about the um, Batley Grammar School uh, incident. It's been three years since a teacher was essentially sent into hiding uh, after showing a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad in a religious studies class. There were huge protests gathered outside uh, the school. Um, recent reports have suggested that um, no one really uh, in power or in the local authority uh, ever condemned the protest. Um, he was never considered to be a victim of a crime, despite the persistent harassment and intimidation he obviously felt. Um, Tom, I mean, this case is just, you know, surely just shocks everyone. It's quite an eye-opener as to what's going on in this country. Ab absolutely. And the fact that um, all this time later, as far as we can tell, I mean, I haven't seen any reporting suggest otherwise, he still more or less remains in hiding, hasn't gone back to work at the school. Um, it just feels like um, continuing to unfurl sort of tragedy and complete failure to stick by him. I mean, the recent Dame Sarah Khan report, which has sort of brought this back into the conversation, it is also three years on the two probably were time to coincide with one another, really points out that he was failed more or less at every level. So yeah. almost immediately after this controversy begins, um, you have the school issue this sort of groveling apology and to suspend him. There's this really strange twist as well where uh, uh, an officer from West Yorkshire police read out this statement to the crowd of protesters outside. Mm. So you had the kind of police being implicated almost in this act of capitulation. You had the local MPs basically in in not so many words say that the school made the right decision yeah. by taking this. The response from the Department for Education then led by Gavin Williamson, if anyone remembers him, was again sort of trying to look both ways on this particular issue, condemning threats and intimidation, but also saying that they need to balance their, the school needs to balance its responsibilities with be, to educate, with being sensitive to religious sensitivities and so on. And so what this amounted to was a rank capitulation to hardliners and zealots who wanted to dictate what a school could teach. And not mm -hmm. only did it take this tremendous personal toll on this teacher, who by all accounts seems like a pretty upstanding person who's been completely thrown under the bus by this whole process in the new report because um, Sarah Khan seems to have spoken to him directly. He talks about having essentially almost like PTSD as a consequence of what he'd been through. But also the fact that the school dropped this material from their curriculum. Yeah. He wasn't going rogue when he taught this. Apparently he'd been taught for at least two years previously without any incident. And so what we have is a situation in which you have hardline hard, um, religious activists authoritarians dictating a school curriculum and yet everyone's fine with it hmm. because of the supposed community sensitivities involved it's it's such a it's um on the one hand it's um shocking but it's not surprising as is often the case in things like this yeah i mean we often see that and, and just thinking about that with the police reading out the statement to the protesters i mean we saw a similar thing in uh, wakefield where you know a young boy was accused of scuffing a quran and you know his mother sat next beside a police officer and the, and the police officer is giving you know this boy a non-crime hate incident and doing nothing about the people trying to intimidate a child yeah agreed i mean i was really interested to read the khan review because i think what is fascinating about that report is that it tries to situate the batley incident in the context of lots of other kinds of mm. harassment. Mm. So it says this incident occurred at a time when we have massive online hate and we have lots of people hassling politicians and we have, uh, you know, uh, women, she cites one case about a woman, a Sikh woman who was harassed by local Sikh fundamentalists and feared for her life. And all of this is part of the same picture, according to Khan. I think that's just completely wrong yeah. mm. because uh, it fails to appreciate the unique circumstances around Islamist intimidation. And the unique element of this, as Tom suggested, is the official capitulation around yeah. it. And so it fails to identify that or, or ask why it is that when this intimidation is coming from Islamists, people in the establishment, the police, schools, councils, and to some extent the government seem totally willing to capitulate. And I think the, the review missed a trick in failing to engage with that question. Definitely. I mean, it seems that people are reluctant to even use the word Islamist. I mean, mm. we saw, you know, several weeks ago when Speaker of the House of Commons felt, you know, sufficiently intimidated to change parliamentary procedure. There was lots of sort of vague uh, accusations of where this intimidation might be coming from. We all knew where it was coming from, mm. but they couldn't say it. And it's also worth saying, because there was another report that came out a couple of weeks ago, which was an independent report, but the Commission for Countering Extremism put it out as a sort of government body. 
Um, and it was making the point, amongst others, that um, first of all, that a lot of this anti-blasphemy activism, which is mm. taking place, um, it's really something that we really need to take very, very seriously. Because on the one hand, many of the people involved will explicitly say, you know, we don't want violence. We want, um, I think one of the lead campaigners outside Batley said Muslims should make them their views known in the democratic way. And yet you look at all of these cases I've been talking about, Wakefield, Batley, the Lady of Heaven protests, mm. and the people involved have very close links or a lot of nice things to say about violent extremist anti-blasphemy movements in Pakistan, where this mm. has become a horrendous issue over the course of the past 10 or 15 years in particular. So they're kind of looking both ways on those on those issues, a lot of these activists. So there's a refusal to recognise that. But another thing that that report points out, which is often not um, recognised in this discussion, is that um, this isn't just a case of the kind of w the right of a white Brit to sound off about Muhammad or Islam yeah. or whatever, that often the people who are very much at the sharp end of anti-blasphemy activism are liberal Muslims, ex-Muslims or members of dissenting Muslim sects. Mm. I mean, the two people who have been killed, as far as I can tell, over the course of the past 10 or 15 years in this country, as a consequence of being painted as heretics or blasphemers, were both Muslims themselves. It was an Ahmadi Muslim, Assad Shah, and a Muslim imam in Rochdale, I believe. They were killed within about a month of each other. By He was called Jalal Uddin, and he was killed by some kind of ISIS fanboys. Shah was killed by, a, by just a sort of would-be anti-blasphemy activist. And also, you know, people forget about Hatton Tash, who's yeah. the sort of um, ex-Muslim, now kind of Christian preacher, spends her time at Speaker's Corner <laughs> wearing a Charlie Hebdo t-shirt and preaching against her former faith. I mean, she was stabbed multiple times. They never caught her assailant. Mm. And more recently, she was the main target of a terror plot to try and kill her and also to attack any other policemen and soldiers in the, in, nearby. People never really talk about these cases because precisely because of the fact that they don't fit the narrative, yeah. which is beloved by both Islamists and kind of credulously repeated by wokists, which is that to be concerned about the attempt to clamp down on supposed anti-Islamic blasphemy is to engage in basically a kind of form of racism. You want to gin up some kind of clash of civilizations mm. that that's what your main game is. Those inconvenient victims disrupt that, which is part of the reason why, despite some them, them kind of suffering the kind of lethal consequences in some cases of this anti-blasphemy bigotry and activism, they're not talked about in the slightest. Yeah, Luke. And I also think, I mean, we, we experienced this in East London in, we, in, the, in the aftermath of uh, October the 7th when uh, a young child at a local school went to the school draped in a Palestinian flag, mm. was sent home, told not to wear a flag to school, uh, and that led to demonstrations outside the school. And I think there is a, a general uh, reluctance to say that some form of protest, and especially when uh, the, the protests take the form that can be very intimidating, just aren't acceptable. You know, a school is not the appropriate place to have out uh, a demonstration about uh, Gaza. Mm. And, you know, we've seen similarly the walkouts and the, the, the children leaving school in order to attend Gaza, Gaza demonstrations. There has to be a line drawn about, uh, about the nature of these protests because, of course, uh, freedom of expression is important. And that has to be balanced against the need to uh, maintain the, the right does not extend to being intimidatory with your pro with your protest for the reasons that Tom has explored. So we, we see this play out on the on the streets of local communities in way which in ways which might fall behind violence even, but can still be extremely intimidating and create a, cl a climate where people are very worried about engaging in debate.